Well, hello everyone at the Cisco Learning Network and on our own blog site, stormwindlive.com forward slash blog. I want to welcome everyone back to our series of videos that we are doing on none other than multicast. My name is Anthony Sequera, Cisco Certified Internet Work Expert and Cisco Certified Systems Instructor, and we want to jump right back in. Last time we talked to you about multicast in general, kind of an overview of this important technology, and we promised you last time that we would pick up by looking at these multicast addresses in more detail in this video. Let's do that right now. Let's jump into a look at multicast addressing. You probably remember, you probably remember that, let me uh, get a hold of my uh, correct slide I want to show you right now. You probably remember that from your CCNA studies, we have class D addresses that are our multicast addresses. As it turns out, these addresses have the first four bits in that 32-bit IP address. They're going to be set to 1110. That's going to give us a numeric range for our multicast addresses of 224.0.0.0 through our 239.255.255.255. So that's the overall multicast address range. But it's very, very important you realize about these multicast group addresses that not all of the addresses are created equal there's going to be reserved addresses for special purposes. As a matter of fact, in the last video, we talked about and showed you an example. I'll show it again to you, don't worry. But we showed you an example of local scope addressing. Yeah, we come across these a lot. Local scope multicast addresses are in the range 224.0.0.0 through 224.0.0.255. They're going to be useful and they're going to be used for multicasting on just a local link. Uh, maybe there's five or six people on a broadcast link. Maybe there's just two individual devices on a point-to-point -point link. These multicast addresses, like I said, are going to be only useful on that link. They've got a TTL of one typically to make sure they can't be forwarded beyond the link. And we've got some very famous examples of these. 224.0.0.1 to indicate all hosts on the link. 224.0.0.2 we're going to see utilized for multicast routers. And yes, we're going to be doing videos on multicast routing here for you at the CLN. Notice 224.0.0.5, that's our all OSPF devices, but when we're on a broadcast or non-broadcast multi-access segment and we need to send something just to that king of the hill router, that designated router or DR, we'll address the multicast transmission to 224.0.0.6. Those designated routers subscribe to that traffic by utilizing the 224.0.0.6 address on their network card and that's how they can get the information destined to that particular address. In the last video, we jumped up on one of my devices. I think it was the R1 device. And the R1 device is running EIGRP. So we can literally see the EIGRP packets being sent by our device to none other than one of those link local in scope multicast addresses. Let's go ahead and, and check that out again. Let's jump over to our R1 device. And again, because we're not in production, we can do this particular command of debug IP packet and not even worry about constraining this output at all. We uh, don't have much going on in this little lab environment, but notice we do indeed have EIGRP going on. We can see these packets, these EIGRP packets that are destined for 224.0.0.10. Sure enough, we now know that this is indeed a link locally scoped multicast transmission. Pretty cool. 
And there are other address ranges in the multicast scope that are reserved. Uh, like, they took transient address ranges and defined those. Now, you're probably thinking, what in the world do we mean by transient addresses? Well, these can be utilized by applications and then surrendered by applications in various scope. There's a global range from 224.010 to 238.255.255.255. As an example, we have addresses that begin 224.2, and these are for multicast backbone applications. Applications that are being used in the multicast backbone of the internet itself. So, remarkably vast scope there for those multicast apps. Site local scope, this is pretty neat. This kind of reminds us of our RFC 1918 IP addresses, doesn't it? We can use 239.253.00/16 for site local scope applications of multicast, and we even have an organization local scope of 239.192/14. It wouldn't be a complete discussion about multicast addressing without discussing our GLOP addresses. This is absolutely hysterical. GLOP, why I find this so funny is true story folks, GLOP doesn't stand for anything. You would think like globally, uh, listable, organizational, no. GLOP doesn't stand for anything. It's a name they made up. Having some fun, they made up a name for this particular reserve space. Uh, what goes on here is a company with a public AS number can go ahead and encode their AS number in those two middle octets. So it's 233XX0 through 233XX255. You'd insert your AS number in the middle there, and it's a way for your organization to have some reserved scope globally on the public internet. Pretty interesting idea. By the way, one of the issues with GLOP addressing is that once we put our two, uh, our AS number in the middle octets, we don't have a lot of addresses left, just 255 in that last octet for identification of particular multicast applications. Everything that we've talked about in this video on these important multicast addresses is all defined for you in the RFCs. So check out RFCs on multicast addressing to get more information. A lot of these RFCs are very, very readable. Absolutely. In fact, you'll find that some authors, unfortunately, have plagiarized from them in their own materials on multicast. Well, thank you so much for joining us, folks, in this Cisco Learning Network video on that missing information from the CCNP track. It's all about multicast. We'll be back in this particular discussion with plenty more videos for you on this important and often missing topic from CCNP. Thanks again, everybody.